All right, good morning. I'm Dr. Freed, a professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Anatomy, and I'll be giving you some of the lectures in uh, the cell biology component, the histology component, and I'll be seeing you over this block in the uh, lab modules. So, uh, first of all, I want to quickly apologize. Uh, when I looked this morning at the slides that were loaded, there are more slides there than I'll be talking about. I kind of edited back. The extra slides there are not just extra slides. I usually will riff on a topic, and I'm trying to keep it a little tighter this year, so I won't riff as much, and so I'm just going to talk about the slides. If you see slides appearing that I don't talk about, don't worry about it. It's not that they're not important, it's just that they're covered basically in the other material I'm covering, okay? So, um, let me start out with, with a principle, right? Because part of what we're trying to do is teach you ideas and principles in this. And uh, it goes to uh, I'm going to tell you what life is, all right? Pretty important principle, right? Life is chemistry that occurs at the right time at the right place. And what we do in cell biology is try to figure out the mechanisms that allow that to occur so that chemistry can occur at the right time at the right place within the cells, okay? Now, part of the mechanisms that are involved in that you've already been introduced to by Dr. Luria when he talked about membranes because we compartmentalize for example, just looking at the cell, we have the plasma membrane, and then we have compartments, which define spaces in which specific reactions can carry it, be carried out and on, under controlled conditions. So we have nucleus, we have endoplasmic reticulum, you'll hear, we have the Golgi, we have lysosomes, we have mitochondria, subcellular compartments define that, so we have a way of controlling where reactions occur. But many of us think about What's going on in the cell is kind of molecules just running around randomly, bouncing around. And in fact, the cellular space itself is organized by elements we call the cytoskeletal elements, which was the topic of today's lecture, which not only organize all the space within the cell, but help things move very efficiently from one compartment to another compartment. It's not done by just uh, Brownian motion, okay? So a lot of the chemistry and biochemistry that you've heard and you'll hear more about is actually localized to very specific places in the cell by its interaction and control by these cytoskeletal elements. Uh, what I've shown you on the first slide, by the way, uh, the couple, I'll be in other lectures drawing a lot uh, using the screen. I don't know, can you see the little green dot up here pretty well? And because uh, otherwise I can draw draw arrows. I don't know if that's more helpful or not. So let me see if I can stand back over here. Can you guys? Uh, I'm going to drop the lights for a minute. So these are fluorescent micrographs of cells in culture. Uh, uh, decorated with uh, antibodies uh, or fluorescent probes so we can visualize where things are. And there are several different types of cytoskeletal elements. I'm going to only be talking about the three major ones. The microfilaments, a.k.a. Uh, uh, actin filaments, the microtubules, and the intermediate filaments. And they're visualized here, and you can see that in the, micro, in the case of the microfilaments, of these actin, cytoplasmic actin filaments, they're organized in a structure we call stress fibers. You also notice the shadow in the background over here. There's no actin filaments or actin structures that make up an organized structure that we know of within the nucleus itself, okay? So these are what, why we call it cytoplasmic. Now, there are other organizations of actin uh, filaments within the cell, and the ones that we see with histology and fluorescent micrographs are the ones that stand out the most. And we'll talk about that in the background over here. There are other structures involving actin filaments. In the left over here are microtubules, and again, you, don't, you see the shadow over here, and there's nothing lighting up the microtubules in the nucleus, because there are no microtubules in the nucleus. They're all cytoplasmic. And we'll talk more about the fact that they all seem to come from this one spot over here, very important. Over here are intermediate filaments. And again, there are intermediate filaments that are going to be found cytoplasmically, and then a special classes of intermediate filaments that are found in the nucleus. The one that's shown here with a specific antibody uh, are uh, totally cytoplasmic. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through 
First of all, the stru uh, each one of these individually, the structure of it, uh, how it's synthesized, how it's assembled in the cell, and their function within the cell. Okay, and I'm going to go systematically starting with microfilaments to microtubules to intermediate filaments. And what I want you to do as I'm doing this, and I'll try to stress it in lecture, but it's your responsibility actually, to uh, see what is similar and what is different about these different uh, set of, uh, uh, skeletal elements. Okay? You, you're, and same thing in nostalgia. You look at a structure, what is similar about these structures, what distinguishes these structures. So uh, uh, all of these have some similarities, some of them, and they have very specific differences that give them very special properties. By the way, these micrographs were taken uh, by uh, Gopal Murthy, famous microscopist at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. All right. So we're going to first start uh, talking about microfilaments, also known as actin filaments, cytoplasmic actin filaments. And overall, their morphology is they're about 5 to 7 nanometers in diameter, and they are a double helix. I'll talk more about that in a minute. The key thing for you is that they are what we call polar structures. I'm going to use that term a lot. Polar means that they have one end that's different than the other, sort of like a magnet. There's a plus end and a minus end. All right. That's very important because any molecule bound to an asymmetric structure has a plus end and a minus end, has an orientation. So if you orient these fibers within the cell, molecules bound to them know where they are within the cell. Okay? So uh, we're going to talk about the fact that they're intrinsically asymmetric and why that is true. The other point that we'll make uh, is that these are dynamic structures. They're constantly forming and uh, unforming polymerizing and depolymerizing. So the dynamics of it are critical to how they function within the cell. So where do we get all this information? Well, a lot of it comes from electron microscopy. These are microfilaments that were created by some biochemist type in a test tube. That's not what they really look like in the cell. And as you see that they are, look like a strand, and you can actually make out that the fact that these subunits that make them up uh, are kind of asymmetric looking. Uh, they're, they're, but the artist who drew this drew it as little spheres. So you lose the sense of asymmetry when you draw things as spheres. It turns out that the subunits that make these up are, are globular proteins, but they're not spheres. Okay? Um, the other important thing is as you look at this, you see that there is a helix to it. And if you look at the way the subunits are organized, indeed they're in a perfect double helix. But they're not a double helix made of two separate strands wound around each other. As you'll see when we talk about their assembly, in fact, they're one subunit stacked and offset on top of the other one, and they create, in fact, a perfect double helix just by stacking single subunits, one on top of the other. So what about the protein that makes it up? The basic subunit is the actin subunit. It's a globular protein of about 45,000 molecular weight. Essentially, all the cytoplasmic actin in a cell is the same. There's some variance, uh, uh, but overall, just think about it. It's the same molecule. And the, way, the fact that the actin filaments are being used, the microfilaments are being used for different purposes, is because of different molecules that bind to the filaments, not because the actin itself is different. Okay? That's an important distinction from some of the other structures we'll be talking about. So what gives them specificity are these actin binding proteins. So let's talk a little bit about this actin subunit uh, and how it's, uh, and we'll talk more about how it's assembled. This is from a crystallographic study that was done uh, a while ago, and uh, you can see that even though the artist draws it as a little sphere, that a globular protein is intrinsically asymmetric. It has an N-terminal end, C-terminal end, and they're folded up so that one surf head is different, the surface is different than the other, the surface is different than that, and that means that it can interact with different proteins specifically within the cell. Now, this interface over here, and this over here, interface over here, is called the plus end and the minus end. And the reason that it's called the plus end and the minus end is a convention that we have. The plus end is the end at which new subunits can add on and the polymer can grow. It's a convention they're, they're, for no other reason than that. Um, but you can see that at an atomic level, the plus end is different than the, the, what we call the minus end. This gives rise to the polarity. Now, the reason that the filament itself is, is asymmetric is that it is created by just stacking one subunit on top of the other. 
And so this would be the uh, uh, plus end. It would be the next subunit on. Next, the colors are just so that you can tell one subunit from the other. They're identical at the molecular level. And uh, so that you can see that this displacement, of just stacking them on top of that, gives you a perfect double helix. Um, all right. Now, the fact that the surfaces over here are, are, are different allows many different types of specific binding proteins to interact with this and use this filament, once it's formed, as a, a different structure for different things, depending on what's available to bind to these surfaces. Okay? So here's just a, a kind of repertoire or collection of, you don't have to remember this, but there are different, uh, many, many, this is just a few, uh, uh, proteins that specifically bind to those amino acids on the surface of the actin subunit that organize then the filament in different ways. Okay, and uh, so this again, the specificity of how the filament is used once it's formed is determined by these actin uh, binding proteins. Here's just one example: a filament uh, dimer over here uh, is able to cross-link the actin filaments and form a net. Others will allow them to form organized structures. We'll talk about one in particular, which we've already been introduced to, with the microvilli. So this is kind of a nice summary slide. Uh, you have we're showing how these things, uh, depending on what the, fil the protein is, can interact and change how those uh, 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 the filament can be used in different ways. All right. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now the assembly. We have the cell that has subunits and has filament forms. What regulates that? Because the amount and where those filaments are determines, obviously, what proteins there can then bind and what's going to happen. Now, the key here is that this it requires ATP. And the reason it requires ATP, and it wasn't shown, is that in that subunit, I'm just going to go back over here, is that the subunit itself is not just a globular protein. It actually has an enzymatic activity. It has an intrinsic ATPase activity. So this protein, the subunit, can exist in two forms. It can exist in the ATP form, with ATP binding in a pocket here, and that's going to change the structure of that. The ATP form is the form that is al allows it to bind effectively and efficiently to the plus end so that you can form uh, filaments uh, from subunits. Now, when the ATP activity, ATPase activity of the actin subunit hydrolyzes the ATP, it goes, the ATP goes to ADP. The ADP part is still bound within this pocket, but the loss of that phosphate changes the conformation of this subunit, and so it interacts differently. When the ATP form of the subunit will bind at this end, it's in a different conformation than at this end because by the time you get over here, the ATP has been hydrolyzed to ADP and the conformation of this subunit is different. So its binding properties are different and how you can add subunits is different. We'll see how that affects it when we look at synthesis. So over here, even though this is drawn as little spheres or globular things, realize that the ATP conformation of the subunit over here is very different than the ADP conformation of the subunit over here. So what regulates the ability of this filament to form and how long it can form depends on how available the ATP subunit is uh, compared to the ADP, because the ADP form it doesn't bind very tightly to its neighbors and will fall off very rapidly, while the ATP form allows more ATP subunits so you get growth. And in fact, you have to take the ADP to the ATP back as this cycle goes around, and there are special proteins in the cell that will facilitate the conversion of the uh, ATP uh, exchange, the ATP in the cytosol for the ADP, and change the conformation of the subunit. So what are some of those, those uh, regulatory molecules? These are some more of these actin binding proteins. One of them is a molecule called profilin, okay, which has two functions. First of all, it binds the ADP form of the uh, actin subunit and facilitates the exchange of ATP for ADP to get it back into the ATP form. And once in the ATP form, it can bind very efficiently to the plus end and uh, allow that.
uh, if it if it's, doesn't have that activity, which is regulated by other modifications in the cell, it kind of buffers or traps the uh, ATP sub the ADP subunit in the cytosol, so it's not available. And if it's not available, what'll happen is it'll destabilize this end, and eventually we'll lose subunits from both, and the thing will depolymerize. Now, there's other molecules that bind. Uh, like a molecule called gel solin, which will bind to the surface of the uh, polymer over here, the filament over here, and will destabilize it and, and create fragments. Once it binds to this end, as long as it's bound, you can't lose subunits, but the fragment that's formed now, because it's been around for a while, that this end is now the ADP end, so subunits are going to keep falling off this. So this is a way that you can take big filaments and make them into short filaments, and so there's ways the cell has of regulating uh, both where these filaments can form and how long they are. Okay. Now, those, those profilin and the ATP form uh, uh, allow for other kinds of interactions to occur. Uh, different than the other structures we're going to talk about, this is the microtubules and the microfilaments a little later, uh, microfilaments can actually form branches. And they form a branch by complexing with another set of proteins. You don't have to remember what the names are. ARP23 complex doesn't you, don't, you won't be asked about that, but remember that there are some special proteins that bind. And when they bind, they can start a new site for which new subunits can grow. So this would be the ADP end of the subunits would be where new subunits are coming in in the ATP form. And so you can get branches over here. And that becomes very important for how cells can move and change the shape of their surface. All right. Now, facilitating the addition of those subunits, so the idea that, well, you have these subunits floating around in the cell, and you can form these filaments anywhere. Well, actually, to have them form in biological time, this is in milliseconds rather than in many seconds, all right. There are other protein complexes that help facilitate the uh, recruitment of the ATP form of the subunit in the profilin complex, and those are a special molecule complex called formins, and they are at the growing ends of many of the microfilaments. So the assembly of these microfilaments is, and the disassembly is very dynamic, but intrinsically it's regulated by other proteins and happens very, very quickly. Okay, because it, it is not limited by diffusion, but in fact catalyzed by the assembly of other proteins. All right, so once we have these filaments, what good are they? What are they used for? And they're used in a lot of different ways. I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but we'll mention them later on in the course as we, we enter into specialized functions of cells. Uh, one is cell division. Uh, endocytosis, transport, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in a couple of weeks, cell shape change, cell motility, and very specialized stru structures, one of which is the microvilli, which Dr. Luria already talked to you about. So where are the actin filaments used? Well, during cell division, they form a girdle or bridge to help contract for a contractal ring that will separate the two daughter cells uh, after the nuclei have reformed in uh, after... Uh, anaphase. Uh, epithelial cells that Dr. Luria talked about have an adhesion belt, and that adhesion belt is made of actin filaments. They're not contractile, but they are forming a, a network around over here that helps position and organize structures within the surface of the cell. And then we have those stress fibers I showed you uh, where they were, and that helps with motility of the cell as it moves along the surface of, of uh, the extracellular matrix material. Now, the guy that Dr. that Dr. Luria talked about, you already been exposed to, is the microvilli. So these are transmission electron micrographs of microvilli. The plasma membrane is coming over the surface. These are all apical structures on epithelial cells. Um, there, there is a network of uh, the adhesion belt is coming across over here. Uh, you can see elements of microfilaments down. Uh, where the uh, actin filaments from the microvilli are penetrating into the cytoplasm. This is a longitudinal section. This is a transverse section. Again, you can see the plasma membrane and cross sections through the individual actin filaments. Now, those actin filaments are held together in registry, 
by the binding proteins that are specific and allow these structures to form. And the plus end of the normal plus end, where those actin filaments are formed, are all away from the cytoplasm. So the plus ends over here, that's where the ATP form of the subunit would have gone to form the filament. But you would realize that with time that, that hey, uh, once this forms, how do you get more subunits out here? And if it goes to ADP, won't this just depolymerize? So they're binding proteins that end up capping these ends so that they won't depolymerize, even though this would be the plus end. So the organization of all the actin filaments in the microvilli are all organized the same way. The plus end over here, the minus end over here, but in the stable uh, microvilli, they're, uh, they're all in the ADP form of the subunits, and the reason they're stable is because they have all these binding proteins that hold them and register. Now, uh, he, Dr. Rio also mentioned that you can have different size micro, you have the re regular microvilli, which are about uh, a fraction of a micron in diameter, or maybe one micron or less. And then you have stereocilia, which are very long microvilli and uh, can go many, many microns in length. They're all made up of actin filaments with specific binding proteins. The plus end of all the filaments is organized away from the surface of the cell, distal to the cell surface, and are stabilized by the fact that there are binding proteins out there. Okay. Uh, there's another place that you will see the actin filaments play a role, and this is kind of is taken from the stress fibers and adhesion belts. And those are, it, this would be a desmosomal structure over, uh, sorry, not a desmosomal structure. This is a, a, a contact site. Uh, we'll talk about desmosomes later. Uh, that the molecules that uh, uh, will link the surface of the cell that, uh, to the extracellular matrix material are integrins. They will organize binding proteins that will then help organize and bind to actin filaments, which are uh, going to bind to them uh, uh, under uh, various metabolic conditions and help orient the cell and help the cell move across the substratum. Okay. So that is kind of the actin filaments are dynamic, they're intrinsically asymmetric, and the only reason that we see them at any one time is because there are binding proteins that will stabilize them. And, uh, but because they're asymmetric, it means that anything bound to them is oriented. It knows which end is away from the cell, uh, within the cell, and which end is away from the minus end, which is toward the plus end. All right. So microtubules. How are microtubules similar and different from uh, uh, actin filaments? Well, they're made up of different types of subunits, but again, they're going to be polar asymmetric structures. So that is common to actin filaments and microtubules. The other important thing is that, that um, uh, that's a different, is that instead of being a single fiber, they're made, uh, they uh, appear to be organized in tubes, which are about 24 nanometers in diameter. And they look like the subunits in them are organized into what we call 13 protofilaments, which is a way of describing how the uh, uh, subunits are, are interacting within the uh, tube. All right. So it's an asymmetric and it's a tube. And as we'll see, it's made up of exactly the same kinds of sub, uh, the same pairs of subunits. So all the microtubules in the cell for generalized purposes, in all cells is exactly the same subunits. And again, what's going to give them specificity is what's going to bind to them and how they're going to be organized. Okay, But they play a very, very special and different role uh, than the actin filaments. So this, again, is a fluorescent micrograph uh, decorating the microtubules uh, in a cell. And you see that uh, unlike the, the actin filaments, which I showed you, which could be fibers and stress fibers or things, that these are all organized. And in fact, if I were to tra trace any one of these fibers down, they would all come from a common perinuclear center over here. This is a nucleus, which is not staining. So in fact, what the, the microtubules seem to be all organized, radiating from a common site. And that becomes really, really important. Now, the micro, this is, again, a microtubule formed by a biochemist in a laboratory in a test tube. Uh, it's much harder to see what those are really within the cell. Uh, and you can see that, in fact, as you look down, the diameter of this is about 24 nanometers. Uh, this is the uh, uh, cross section through it. This is transmission electron micrograph. And this is kind of an artist's view of what's there. If I look over here, there are like 13 rows of 
of subunits coming down. And those subunits are, are organized uh, 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 around a kind of an empty core over here, although we now know that there are activities that appear inside that, that tube. All right? We don't know what they do, but they're there. Uh, and the surface of this is what we're seeing are alternating uh, uh, dark and light, and that represents the heterodimer of the subunits that make it up. The building block of the microtubules is not just a single globular protein, but a dimer of globular proteins. The globular proteins are the alpha and beta subunits, so that, that's the building block. In the cell, all the subunits for the microtubules are present as alpha-beta heterodimers. Okay? Those subunits themselves are each about 55,000 molecular weight, and uh, what again will give spe specialness to the microtubules is the proteins that bind to it, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Now, if we look at these alpha-beta heterodimers, here's the beta subunit, here's the alpha subunit, uh, you notice that from an atomic point of view that they look very, very similar, and they are. They're kind of conserved, uh, evolutionarily derived one from the other. Uh, but in fact, uh, there's some really interesting properties about this. First of all, you notice again, it's an intrinsically asymmetric or polar structure. Globular proteins are also always asymmetric. The N-terminal, C-terminal end of the folded proteins over here. One surface is different than the other. One surface is different than the other. So as a heterodimer, this looks different at this end than that end. The surface looks different. Now, the fact that it's in a tube means that a lot of the, protein, the amino acids that are interacting to form that tube are uh, not available for other proteins to bind to. So there are very few places on microtubules that other effector proteins or binding proteins can interact. It turns out that almost all of the, sub, the uh, surfaces that we see over here are involved in subunit-subunit interaction to create the tube. And the only place that other molecules in the cell can interact with it are at the, C ter at the carboxy terminal end tube that's coming out. And I have a picture of that over here. So all of the other sub uh, amino acid residues in this protein are involved in forming the interactions that form the tube, both longitudinally and circumferentially. But that any protein that binds to the microtubules has to bind its carboxy terminal end, which are highly uh, uh, negatively charged uh, uh, amino acids over here. Okay. And so there's a limited repertoire of binding proteins that can interact with microtubules. So if you have one protein that interacts with the microtubule, it really precludes another molecule from interacting with the microtubule. It's kind of like a game of Go, if you will. Now, once you form that microtubule, uh, there are going to, again, be various proteins that give rise to specificity. Most of the microtubules, because they're very abundant in neurons, we know about the binding proteins for those and how they interact. Uh, some of them are uh, involved in certain pathological diseases, like in Alzheimer's disease, there's a defect that accumulates a hyperphosphorylated form of a binding protein called tau, which is involved in bundling uh, microtubules and stabilizing microtubules. And the accumulation of that hyperphosphorylated tau causes aggregates called tangles and destabilizes microtubules that are present in the uh, neuron. All right. I'm going to go back a slide over here to the atomic structure because there's something, again, that's critical over here. You notice the word GDP over here and GTP over here. All right. Like with the actin filament, that these subunits can exist in different forms depending on what ligand is bound to them. The beta subunit of the uh, uh, alpha-beta heterodimer has intrinsic GTPase activity. The alpha subunit does not. So the alpha subunit and the, beta and the alpha beta heterodimer is always in the GTP form. But the beta subunit can be, exist in two different forms. It can exist in the GTP form and exist if it cleaves the GTP to GDP in the GDP form. So the alpha beta heterodimer exists really in two different forms, the GTP form and the GDP form. In the GTP form, the conformation of the alpha beta heterodimer allows it to interact very strongly with other alpha beta heterodimers and is active in the polymerization and formation of the microtubule itself. In the GDP form, the conformation destabilizes 
the interaction and it will not bind other new subunits. And so the heterodi the uh, structure of the microtubules is really incredibly highly dynamic. If in the GTP form, the polymer is very stable in the GDP form uh, of the alpha-beta subunits, uh, uh, alpha-beta heterodimer, it is very unstable. We'll talk about that in a minute. So to assemble and, in fact, disassemble, it's regulated by the GTP form or the GTPA's activity of the uh, mi uh, microtubule subunits. And one of the key things we'll see is that, that the formation of the microtubules itself uh, cannot just form at different places in the cell. So when we talked about a formation of actin filaments, that can occur any place in the cell. We can assemble and disassemble actin filaments anywhere. Microtubules are built so that they can only assemble at one particular place in the cell, which means that they give an orientation. We'll come back to that in a minute. All right. So this, under normal conditions, when the GTPA's activity is... is uh, uh, of the beta subunit is uh, working uh, at a normal rate in the subunit concentration of alpha beta heterodimer in GTP form, that the, the plus end, this is the end at which we get growth, that new subunits are added individually, not as filaments, but added individually to <clears throat> the, uh, what we call the plus end. And as long as it's in the GTP form and we have lots of GTP subunits, this thing rapidly polymerizes and forms, extends that too. That's at the plus end. All right. At the minus end, there's a real problem. All right. uh, remember, all the subunits down here would be in the GDP form, and so they would rapidly fall off at, at that end, unless there was something stabilizing them. And at the, at the minus end of all microtubules is a stabilizing set of subunits called or what we what you would call capping proteins, but in fact, they're a special form of uh, uh, tubulin uh, called gamma tubulin, and that all minus ends are embedded in this end. Otherwise, you would lose because they're all GDP by the time you get down there. Now, this growing end continues to grow as long as we have lots of GTP subunits, but because the GTP is being hydrolyzed to GDP, once it gets into the, the uh, tube uh, by the activity of the beta subunit, then suddenly we'll end up with, if we don't add new subunits quite quickly enough, this will all become GDP. And that means that they'll rapidly fall off and the microtubule will uh, depolymerize. And what will happen is that the, uh, uh, we'll either be able to grow rapidly, uh, and if we can't grow, what will happen is that we lose it. That's called dynamic instability. Okay, so either microtubules will be growing, or they will be depolymerized, and it happens very, very quickly. So, what would prevent it from depolymerizing? Why would we see molecule, uh, microtubules that are relatively stable? It's because there are proteins that will cap this end, bind to it, and not allow the GDP subunits to fall off. Okay, so that dynamics there. And remember, keep in the back of your mind that in fact that the only proteins that can interact with the microtubules are those that can interact with their, their carboxy terminal ends that are sticking out of the alpha-beta heterodimers. So there's only one kind of binding site on microtubules that all molecules that interact with the microtubules have to compete for. All right. Now, the very special thing about microtubules, as I say, is that they just don't form willy-nilly in the cell where the concentration of subunits gets high enough. They actually form from organization centers. That organization center is called the centriole, okay? And it's used in a variety of different ways, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So this, again, is a fluorescent micrograph of cell and culture. And if we were, again, able to trace back all the microtubules uh, uh, to, uh, they would all come from a common point over here, and that's where the centrosome is. The centrosome is made up of two centrioles, all right, which is an organization of triplets of microtubules in a ninefold symmetry. Okay, you, you've heard about nine plus two. Well, this is where that nine plus two is ultimately coming from. So the centriole is a structure of microtubules where there are three microtubules together and they're organized by proteins that bind to it into a structure that has a ninefold symmetry. Okay? Now, 
in an interphase cell, a cell that's not dividing, those centrioles form what we call the cent- region of the centrosome. And all the microtubules in the cell, because that's what we saw in the micrographs, have their minus end coming from the centrosome and the plus ends all out here. Okay? Now, if we stabilize the plus ends and have only a single, that centriole is called a basal body. And from that basal body grows the organization of microtubules that we call either cilium or flagella. Okay? And the reason that those, because this would be the plus end out here, the G, DP form by the time it gets out here, there has to be special proteins that cap this end so that the subunits don't depolymerize. So that ninefold symmetry that we see coming out of a basal body originates from the, or in fact, the structural organization of the centriole itself. Now, the in the interface cell, that means that if we look at it, the plus end of all the microtubules is away from the nucleus, and the minus end is all sitting in the centrosome, uh, which is perinuclear localized. In the case of cilia, we have the basal body and the plus end of all the microtubules in the cilium, and that 9 plus 2 structure are going to be oriented away from the cell, distal to the cell surface, and distal from the uh, centriole or the basal body. During cell division, we'll talk more about that a little later on, uh, we divide the centrosome into two centrioles, which become the spindle poles, and those are used, uh, the microtubules from those are used as tracks to separate the chromosome. So in the principle that we're trying to get here is that all the microtubules have to be organized around a centrosome or a centriole, and in a normal interface cell that doesn't have, they're all of them are either coming from the basal body uh, or from the centrosome itself, which means that if we look at molecules that are bound to the microtubule, that they know what direction the cell is in. They know if they look to the plus end that that's away from the nucleus, and if they look to the minus end, it's moving toward the nucleus. So the importance of the microtubule is not that it's just asymmetric, but it's organized in three space so that any molecule bound to it knows what direction to go to the plasma membrane and what direction to go to the nucleus. So the space is really now given a, 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 an address within it, but where they're going plus or minus. Uh, this is just some of the, uh, uh, helps you maybe organi- uh, figure out, here's the beautiful uh, EM, and then a schematic of the molecules, and we know a lot more of the uh, paired centri- centrioles in the uh, centrosome of an interface cell, and I talked about the gamma tubule and ring complex, all those gamma tubule and ring structures are within the centrosome, so the growth and stabilization of the minus end is that all the, uh, the rings uh, gamma tubule and rings are down here, and the plus ends growing away. All right, and what that means is that if we look at the centrosome over here, we either have growth of new su- uh, GTP subunits coming in, or we have the loss of subunits rapidly because they're in the GDP form, and so we call that dynamic instability. And so, if you can sort of look at me over here, if I'm the centrosome, microtubules are constantly forming and then depolymerizing, that's called dynamic instability, okay? And when my plus end over here reaches a stabilizing point, then that microtubule is stable, okay? And now it gives orientation, because any molecule bound here knows if it wants to go to the plasma membrane, it goes that way. If it wants to go to the nucleus, it goes that way, okay? So this is really an important thing. It gives real dimension and organization, spatial 3XYZ coordinate system to the cell. Now, Dr. Luria talked about the cilia before, 9 plus 2. And uh, again, here is a uh, transmission electron micrograph. Here, a pair of microtubules in the middle, and these uh, nine pairs of microtubules uh, and symmetry. And that ninefold symmetry reflects the fact that they've come out of that basal body that's sitting underneath it with the ninefold symmetry itself. This is a better schematic some of the proteins, we're going to come back because two of the proteins that are associated with each of these pairs of microtubules is a special type of protein called dynin, which is a special motor protein that allows cilia to move. All right. Here's another wonderful uh, electron micrograph showing the uh, organization of the doublets of microtubules and ninefold symmetry around the two pair in the middle, and what you see over here are those dynin molecules. All right. So 
what are they good for? They're good for cilia. They're good for movement of things that cilia do. They're involved in cell division uh, and organizing the poles and the microtubules that are used as tracks to pull the uh, chromosomes of division apart. But, uh, and this is kind of a schematic of, of that, but what they're really, really good for is intracellular transport organelle positioning, and that's because that they are associated with a very special class of proteins called motor proteins. They come in basically two flavors, kinesins and dynins. Kinesins are motor proteins. ATP is an energy source. Dynins use ATP as an energy source as well. Kinesins move proteins uh, from the uh, centriole, centrosome, toward the surface that's called antigrade transport. It goes from the minus end of the microtubule to the plus end. Dynins go in the opposite direction. They go from the plus end to the minus end. We call that retrograde transport. So they're using the microtubules in the cell, which are organized in three space, as tracks to move things along. So here's some transmission electron micrographs of, um, of uh, some uh, kinesins and dynins over here. Whoops, I don't want that, this one. All right, here's a kind of cartoon of that. Here's a dynin moving from the plus end to the minus end. Here's a kinesin moving from the minus end to the plus end. And what are they doing? They're carrying things. They're moving organelles. They're moving So kinesins are going to move cargo from the basically the perinuclear space toward the plasma membrane. Dynins are going to go retrograde from the plus end to the minus end. Okay? So... The, the, uh, I'm just going to go through this part very quickly. These are some studies that were done, reviewed in uh, physiological reviews, showing the role of kinescence in moving organelles and their role in various stages. These are uh, deep etch electron micrographs showing uh, kinescence moving various, here's a mitochondria being moved along the microtubules, here's a vesicle being moved along the microtubule. And they're involved in tissue formation, proper tissue. They're involved in cell death. Uh, if you knock out genetically the different specific kinescents, and there are many different kinescents. There are something like 60 different kinescents. They have very specific functions. They move very specific things at different times in the cell. And so they're absolutely, we know they're critical for normal cellular and tissue development because if we genetically modify them, the cell, the tissue doesn't develop properly and the behavior of them doesn't work. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about ciliary movement because it'll become important when we talk about the respiratory system in particular. Those dynins, again, are going to move from the uh, uh, plus end toward the, uh, the minus end. That's the way kinescents move. So what is the cargo? Go for that. Well, the cargo is this pair of microtubules. So this pair of microtubules, if we look at this pair over here, is being moved by those dynins uh, from the plus end to the minus end, which means this is going to slide. Here's a schematic of it. Uh, we, we are going to, here, here's the, the, the bound dynins, and so it's going to move this guy by the other pair of microtubules. Now we can, you know, the relativity problem, who's moving by what? We can either say that this is moving down or the other thing is moving up. But in the, in the cilia, the base, the minus end of those microtubules is embedded in the basal body. So there's no way that these, these guys can slide by each other. And instead of sliding, what they do is they torque, they bend. And that's the why the cilia are able to move. What's really neat is that those dynin, the hydrolysis of uh, ATP to make them move, is um, uh, 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 coordinated so that this is happening. We don't know exactly what coordinates the movement of all those dynins so that the cilia are able to beat in a coordinated way. All right, so the importance of microtubules is that they give organization to space and are used as, particularly as tracks to move things very specifically around the cell. By the way, those dynins and kinescents move at very high rates of speed, one micron per second. Some of them move at five microns per second. The dimension of a cell is like a few microns. So in less than a second, you can make something near the nucleus, transport it out to the, side, to the plasma membrane, or take something from the plasma membrane and move it internally. With in, less, in a deterministic way in less than uh, a second. Okay, so that's, again, things happening at the right time, at the right place. 
Finally, I'd like to talk about the intermediate filaments, because those are very different than the proteins we, than the structures we talked about. This is an electron micrograph. Not, uh, the color is, of course, an art, artifact of how we visualize things. This, is, again, is a fluorescent micrograph. And this is a cell, again, decorated with antibodies to one of the intermediate filament proteins that's found in the cytoplasm. Now, very big difference between the guys that we talked about. First of all, all, the reason we call them intermediate filaments is because they have a size that's intermediate to the size of the actin filaments, and which are about 5, 6 nanometers, and uh, microtubules, which are 24. So more, that's why they're called intermediate. Okay? Uh, but they're all different, except for that dimensionality. Uh, at a molecular level, the intermediate filaments are different proteins unlike actin, which is the same in all cells, and, micro and tubulin, which is the same in all cells, each cell has its own collection of intermediate filaments. But the principle on how they work is all the same, and how they're structured is very similar. But they're different proteins that do different things depending on the cell type. The other important thing is that they're totally symmetric. They're nonpolar. So anything bound to them doesn't know where it is in the cell. It knows that it's bound. So it acts as a surface, or uh, 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 if you will, for the association of other proteins, protein syn synthesis, metabolic activities that will want to localize in the same place, but they don't know how to get there. So once they assemble there, they don't know where they are in the cell, but they're all together. Okay, so they're binding sites. So this is kind of an example. Here are some intermediate filament proteins out here. There are some actin filaments over here, intermediate. And you can see, in this case, there are ribosomes that are clustered and bound to the intermediate filaments so that all the ribosomes that are involved in the synthesis of these messenger RNAs are all in the same place. All right? Now, there are different families. And again, each one represents a heterogeneous. Keratins are found in epithelial cells. And there are a wide variety of keratins. There are acidic keratins. There are basic keratins. Uh, they each have their own molecular characteristic and amino acid sequences made from different genes, uh, but they're common to all epithelial cells. They're another type of intermediate filament called vimentin. They're found in mesenchymal cells, fibroblasts and bone cells and things like that. There's desmin, which is a cell found in muscle cells, and Dr. Entlinger will talk more about that. And then there's glial fibrillary acid protein, which is not found exclusively in glial cells, astrocytes, Schwann cells, and things like that. And is used as a very effective marker to keep track, all of these are markers, to look at the lineage of different cells, particularly in certain diseases and things like that, or during development, where they're coming from. So the glial fibrillary acid protein is really a good mar a marker for these cells of the glial astrocyte Schwann cell lineage. There are special neurofilaments groups of uh, 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 intermediate filaments, which are found exclusively in neurons. And of course, there are nuclear lamins, uh, which uh, uh, you've you, uh, already been introduced to. All right, so what is similar and what's different? Well, they all are, remember I showed you those wonderful globular proteins of the actin uh, su subunit and the uh, beta, uh, the alpha beta subunits of uh, um, uh, uh, tubulin. Uh, well, these are, are actually linear proteins. The N-terminal and C-terminal are very far away, and the bulk of the amino acids that make up their chain are, are uh, in a perfect alpha helix. Okay. And the question is, how do you assemble them? And the other proteins that we talked about had were GTP form to GDP form, ATP form to ATP form. Well, over here, it turns out that they apparently are not, don't have an ATP, ADP function, but they can be modified by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, and that will affect the dynamics of their formation. So how does it work? There are globular domains, but as a rule, you can think about all of these things as being linear molecules uh, made up of alpha helices. And so this is a kind of an alpha helix, alpha helix, alpha helix. And these alpha helices can wrap around each other. So a single molecule of any one of, of these types of uh, uh, intermediate filaments within the same family uh, forms initially, uh, those alpha helices form uh, a dimer of alpha helices, and then they form a, a, a dimer of the dimers, 
And at this stage, you notice that this is asymmetric. It's polar. One end is different than the other. But when it forms the dimer, all of them have the characteristic that they do so in an a, a asymmetric way. So you get N to C, C to N. And this forms a perfectly symmetric structure. And that's going to be the building block for the uh, filament, which becomes the 10 nanometer filament, which we see in the cell. So any molecule bound to this doesn't know where it is in the cell. It's just a surface to it to bound to. All right? Now, it's not going to bind to the helices itself, but it's going to bind to these globular domains that are spaced along it. So how are these organized? Well, we're going to be talking about the intermediate filaments uh, 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 that we're going to see. And many of them are associated with the, uh, the membrane uh, de de structures called uh, desmosomes. And these are going to be uh, uh, at between either cells at the desmosomal junctions or at the hemidesmosomes uh, at the, uh, associated between the basal surface of cells and the extracellular matrix. And again, these have no symmetry uh, uh, they're, they're perfectly symmetric. There's no asymmetry. So any molecule bound to one of these polymers is, uh, doesn't know where it is in the cell and just knows that it can bind there. So what does it bind to, going back over here, there are many globular domains that are kind of are sticking out over here. You can sort of see it over the globular domain. So the formation of the fiber, the filament itself, is going to be away from things. And the N-terminus and C-terminus domains will stick out and act as binding sites to assemble other protein complexes. So that acts as a platform or a structure, but doesn't give orientation to it. The key thing is that these cells are regulated by dynamics. So if we phosphorylate these subunits over here, and they depolymerize if we uh, remove the ph phosphorylation. So these are very dynamic, but they have no orientation within the cell. The actin uh, filaments and the microtubule filaments do. So this is acting as a surface or platform within the cell. Okay? So what we have then are we have these uh, uh, different structures that we have. The actin filaments are uh, dynamic. The microtubules are dynamic. The intermediate filaments are dynamic. The actin filaments basically are all the same subunit, and they're different in how they're used depending on the binding proteins that interact with many different sites along the actin filament to have them do different things. The microtubules have only one place that, my, that proteins can interact with them, and that's at that, that uh, carboxy terminal end. And so things can either bind or not bind, but once they bind, they know exactly where they are. They know if they look to the right, one end is going to be different than the other. One's the plus end, one's the minus end. The plus end is going toward the plasma membrane. The minus end is going toward the nuclear or the uh, uh, microtubule organizing center, which is uh, usually right next to the uh, uh, nucleus itself. So any molecule bound to the microtubule knows which way it is and where to go. And we have special motor proteins that allow that. The intermediate filaments are dynamic structures. Again, they can polymerize and depolymerize depending on the phosphorylation of these subunits, okay? But they have different binding properties depending on their un each one's unique, but their overall structure is similar. And they're, they're, while they're dynamic, they don't give organization to things. They give binding sites for things. So we can have sen synthesis sites. We can have assembly sites associated with the intermediate filaments. But it doesn't give overall direction to the cell. Okay? So that kind of covers it. We're going to see uh, as we go through the, uh, the course how the uh, microtubules, the uh, microfilaments, and the intermediate filaments are used not only to distinguish different cell types, but how they're used in giving specific cellular functions. Okay? So that's it. Any questions? Yeah, question? No? Just tipping your head. Yeah, question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right, so a basal body is the single, that single structure that I showed you, the ninefold symmetry of a triplet of my microtubules, okay? By itself, that becomes the basal body for the cilia or flagella that we'll talk about later on. And from that, we'll grow that nine plus two structure that we talked about, okay? A pair of those 
those basal bodies form the centrioles. Okay, and that creates a very specialized organization site involving where the gamma tubulin ring complexes are that allow the growth of the stabilize the minus end of the microtubules so that they can grow. And if they don't get stabilized at their 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 GTP end, they go to GDP, they depolymerize. So that's the dynamic aspect of it, just localized. Okay. Yeah. Question. Ah, all right, so there are a variety of them, uh, depending on what you want to do, okay? So you can have microtubules that are stabilized and stopping halfway through the cell. Some of them will go all the way to the plasma membrane. And so what regulates their length is where those binding sites are, all right? So we can have microtubules of different lengths, but they're all coming from the same minus end. They're all radiating this way. They can stop at different places so that what they interact with can block or cap that end and prevent the depolymerization. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other? And, of course, what they're being used for is tracks to move things around in the cell in a very ordered and rapid way. I mean, we're talking about going across the cell in less than a second. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, if you didn't have a way to stabilize the end other than the laboratory and a test tube kind of thing, that, that minus end would never be able to be formed. So the gamma tubulin ring complex is not dependent on the GTP, GDP form, but interacts stably to form a template from which things can grow or not grow. Okay? Other, if you just had a naked GDP end, the, you'd never get a microtubule. Unless you're in a laboratory with lots of, lots of subunits. Yeah. Question? Excuse me. Hold, hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. All right. So a centrosome and a centriole are, are kind of the same thing. A centriole is a single one of those uh, 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 ninefold symmetry things. Okay. And a pair of them makes a centrosome. Got right. All right. And th that's kind of cool, by the way. They replicate. In a, in a kind of mirror image. So if I have, they're at right angles to each other, as you noticed in the, when I looked at the centrosome, you have one and the other, that that gives actually an XYZ coordinate system to the cell. So when they replicate, they actually form a mirror image of the cell, of the cell. And if you look at the organization of microtubules, at least in cultured cells, you can see that they're the actual mirror image of the, the other cells, so if things move to the left or move to the right, at least at that first level, they get disorganized with time, but, but it's the symmetry of that, that X, Y, Z. You have one centriole going this way, one centriole going this way, and that really gives a coordinate system to the cell. Pretty, pretty neat, actually. Another question? All right. Yeah. All right, so there, there are some, the organization of the basic subunits are the same. There's some other binding proteins that help register it, but basically it's the same, same kind of structure, just that it's recruited in different form. All right, the, the cilium is a 9 plus 2, or flagellum is a 9 plus 2. The, uh, fl the centriole, or centrosome, is, is the structure of nine-fold symmetry with nothing, no pair in the middle. Okay. Now, there are cilia we'll talk about called primary cilia that are missing the two in the middle. Those are not involved in movement. They don't have dynins. All right. And they're sensory. And we'll talk more about those when we talk about some other cells. All right. All right. So, yeah, I'm giving you kind of the overview. It's kind of the, the big, big lie, big picture. All right. All right. Any other questions? All right. Good. Um, why don't you take a five-minute break? See you in five. <laughs>